years ago this spring, two scientists in England bolted together some brass parts and discovered the secret of life. These were unlikely characters to be working on such an important problem. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. Welcome to Secrets of the Sequence. I'm Lucky Severson. Imagine you are tipping back a beer at an English pub when two rather wild-looking characters charge in and announce loudly that they have discovered the secret of life. What would you think? Monty Python, time to water the whiskey to move on to a quieter pub. It's hard to imagine now what the pub patrons 50 years ago thought when two scientists, Francis Crick and James Watson, announced to the lunch crowd that they had made what is now considered the 20th century's most profound discovery. This year marks a jubilee anniversary of the discovery of the double helix, the twisted ladder of DNA molecules at the heart of all life on Earth. When Crick and Watson came bounding out that February day and went to their favorite pub, the Eagle, and they told people over drinks, we've just found the secret of life, they weren't really exaggerating. It was the secret of life. What started with Crick and Watson's excited bar talk at the Eagle pub in Cambridge changed the world. Now we hardly blink when we see that DNA manipulation can make a mouse bald and make its offspring glow in the dark. DNA manipulation can allow plants to kill the pests that used to kill them. It can turn goat's milk into spider webs. It is now commonplace to see DNA evidence analyzed in crime investigations. Without an understanding of the double helix, we would not have had Dolly, the first sheep born without a father. And without the helix, Raelians could not have conceived their claim to the first human clone. The suit that Rail wears looks familiar, calls up images from 1950 science fiction. By mid-century, the advances in the field of microbiology seemed to border on science fiction. In the post-World War II peacetime expansion, science was breaking loose from a narrow focus on military needs, the killing machines, and beginning to explore the basis of life. Electron microscopes were revealing the deep secrets of molecular structures in the nucleus of cells. The fact that deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, carried genetic information was known, but few thought it was a central mechanism in heredity. All the big players ended up getting things wrong. Um, it was folks coming out of left field. Um, you know, the notion that DNA was the hereditary material itself, that was heretical. So these were just, a, there were just a few people who felt that... Well, I, through the 1920s and 30s, um, uh, most smart money was on proteins. Proteins had all these different shapes and could clearly do so many things. They had to be the source of heredity. Among the few contrarians were Francis Crick and James Watson. Both were working at the time on other research projects and not officially assigned to the study of DNA. Crick and Watson working on the structure of DNA, these were hardly the, the orthodox scientific leaders. Jim had come from Indiana, where he was really trained as a zoologist, an interest in bird watching, and seemed like an unlikely character to be doing this at the age of 25. And Francis Crick, a retread physicist who had worked in the Admiralty in World War II, these were unlikely characters to be working on such an important problem. The smart money was on Linus Pauling, a charismatic professor at Caltech in Pasadena, and the leading authority on the structure of protein molecules. Well, in fact, Linus Pauling published first. He completely scooped Crick and Watson by publishing a structure of DNA before they did, except it turned out to be wrong. Pauling theorized that DNA took the form of a triple helix radiating around a sugar phosphate central backbone. And Crick and Watson knew right off the bat that that was nuts, because this sugar phosphate backbone is very negatively charged. You couldn't stick three negatively charged things in pointing at each other. They'd repel each other. How could Linus Pauling blow it like that? 
Linus Pauling's error in basic chemistry gave Crick and Watson a break. A few more months in the race to create a theoretical model of the DNA structure. Key to their final success was a technology called X-ray crystallography. It could render the invisible world of molecules visible, but only to those few who could divine what the strange patterns meant. One of the best at using this extraordinarily difficult imaging science was Rosalind Franklin. You can work out the shape of particular proteins and the shape of DNA, for example. And that's what Rosalind Franklin did. She took crystals of DNA, dried down DNA, shot x-rays into them, got photographic images. And those photographic images, to a practice, the eye, like Francis Crick's, immediately told you that DNA was a helix. And that was a, it's a, a major discovery. Oh, it's a, it's a major thing. In a few days of intense work, Crick and Watson assembled the first rickety model of the double helix. The model was crucial to the two scientists because it allowed them to see and measure the three-dimensional relationship between the two chains of nucleotides and thus determine if the theoretical structure would prove scientifically valid and at the same time agree with what had been revealed in the X-ray patterns. Rosalind Franklin's pictures of DNA, that is X-ray pictures, which revealed to the well-experienced eye of Francis Crick that DNA had to have a helical structure. Crick had been studying crystallography and he recognized the helix when he saw it. it was just an absolutely crucial part. But Crick and Watson sitting alone without real data would not have been able to figure out the structure of the double helix. And it's very clear that Rosalind Franklin sitting alone looking at the structure of the x-ray crystal she had produced didn't attempt to build models around it. So while science often seems like the work of the great individual, it is perhaps more than anything the work of an extraordinary community that both cooperates and competes at the same time. In the half century since, the 3D model of the double helix has been greatly refined and explored. Now, for the first time in experiments at the Molecular Biology Lab at the University of Geneva, the three-dimensional model has been expanded, adding a fourth dimension, time. The result? A fascinating image that reveals a dynamic living helix far more complex than a simple string of code. It's a tremendously important, tremendously exciting chase of fa about, about things, secrets of, of the world, and you want to know them first. It's a chill. I think most people have never had the experience of being the only person in the world to know some fact about nature. So the key to our genes may lie not in where they sit, but in how they dance. Biology's complexity seems to grow exponentially as science digs deeper. It seems the more we learn, the more there is to learn. And it poses a question whether it will ever be possible to know it all. That too is a secret of life. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.